It's that time of the month. I know the ladies watching <laughs> are probably like, "Yeah, I got you." Because yesterday, I got a scar. So I think it will be a bit painful. I feel like it's a bit painful. I feel like it was a men's issue. We have a million different ways to combat things, but with women, there just needs to be more funding in that area. Women playing sport isn't a new thing. And neither is menstruation. But only now are we starting to talk about how the menstrual cycle impacts physical performance. This happens to 50% um, of our population. Um, and so normalising that is a really big thing. Just this thing that's been driven into your head that you don't really talk about periods in public, like don't say period too loud. You have trainings where you feel like you're on top of the world and like you could do anything and then you just have days where you just like get me out of here. I've had like times where it's literally state championships and like my period is coming. It's very like tormenting and I've had to miss out on like competitions. To really explain why this matters we need to start with what menstruation actually is. The main reason we have a menstrual cycle is to release an egg from our ovaries. Eva is an exercise physiologist who specialises in women's health and she's here to help us understand the very complex and pretty impressive monthly cycle. We like to break it down under four more particular subheadings. So we start with our period or, or the menstrual cycle phase when we see that bleed. Our hormones are particularly at their lowest. So oestrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you see them at our lowest. From day one, really, really bad period pains and it wouldn't just last like, I don't know, an hour. I'd be up all night vomiting, like, until you've got nothing left. But it would just keep going, like, bedridden all day long. When I'm on my period, I think the last place I'd ever want to be is the gym. I'd much rather go for a run than go to the gym and do weights or whatever. I'm on my period, I usually don't go to training. I just get like really tired and then like the cramps, that's the most intense pain I ever feel. So I just know, I literally can't like sit up properly when I'm on it, so there's no point. As we gently move into it, our follicular phase of when we cease or stop bleeding, we see testosterone start to increase. This is, you know, where we're feeling a little bit stronger, um, we've got a bit more energy. And then right up to the point of ovulation, we see this great big surge in estrogen. Interestingly, estrogen assists um, in our pain threshold, so our pain should be better with an increase in estrogen. When we see that estrogen rise, it comes down quite dramatically. These hormone changes have different impacts on different people. And for Abby, this point of her cycle is pretty difficult. I tracked my period for like six months or so and found that two weeks, to, one to two weeks before getting my period, I was just crashing, like essentially getting really depressed and down, um, like couldn't get out of bed, having some really bad thoughts. If we don't see then pregnancy being an outcome, we move into what we call the luteal phase. Through the um, luteal phase is progesterone peak. Progesterone is an anti-inflammatory hormone and that's our happy feel-good hormone. So as that comes up, um, we start to feel, again, a bit more energetic, Two weeks after the period, I'm definitely like just on my grind. I'm just being like very energetic and that kind of thing. And the week leading up, I just feel flat and then I know that it's coming. So it's just kind of that mental internal knowing, like the clock of where I'm at. As it starts to taper off, we see that low progesterone and that begins that initiation of the bleed and we're back to the menstrual cycle or that first day of the bleed. At different points throughout the cycle, we might experience heavy bleeding, back pain, headaches, skin changes, cramps, fatigue, breast soreness, depression, anxiety, mood swings, weight gain or sleep disruption. So how do you deal with this as an athlete? These are very real things that happen to women. We need to treat everybody as individuals, but certainly, you know, understand and empathise with things that occur in their menstrual cycles. Meet Dr Rachel Harris from the Australian Institute of Sport, or the AIS. 
She's led some pretty important research in this area and says one of the big problems in managing menstrual cycles in athletes is a lack of research. Women and girls in general are very underrepresented in most research. Only 6% of sports science and sports medicine research actually involve women and girls. Through her work, she's monitored training, interviewed athletes, and looked at factors like nutrition, sleep, recovery, strength, and performance at different stages of the menstrual cycle. There is such incredible individual variation between women um, in their cycles. So there were some women that felt that during their period was the time that they would like to compete. There were some that said just before, there were some that said just after, there were some that said, you know, in the middle of their cycle. So I think that's the really cool thing. We've got women that are breaking world records, you know, winning gold medals, winning world championships, winning grand finals at every single stage of their menstrual cycle. While it can bring difficult symptoms, Dr. Harris's research also shows that athletes can use their menstrual cycles to their advantage. I think it gets a lot of bad press. The changes that occur to our body during puberty and because of that menstrual cycle and the release of those hormones is actually a really positive thing. Oestrogen has really huge benefits on bone, on um, illness and also injuries as well, so does progesterone. Instead of the shame that we have around our menstrual cycles, it would be wonderful if we could actually be more positive about it um, and embrace it as actually a really powerful thing that we can use at different times of the month. Research like this is all super fresh, but we're already seeing its impacts. One example is the women's US soccer team winning the World Cup in 2019 and claiming it was all because they tracked every player's cycle. They're at an advantage by understanding what's happening at a physiological level for each individual player. We can understand how much time are we giving them on field or how much time are they able to tolerate on field. How much do we need to focus on more rest and recovery for these players? You know, for example, in a follicular phase, it's often known as sort of the fat burning or muscle and muscle building phase. So if somebody is in that phase, let's look at, okay, let's train and adapt their training schedule to focus on that. Or, or if it's they're in a luteal phase, let's, let's focus on more of the fat storing and muscle sparing, or let's recover muscle if we need to during those lower hormone phases like the menstrual cycle. This is all great progress, but to discover the real potential that comes with this research, there's a massive cultural hurdle to overcome. We need to actually talk about menstrual cycles. When it doesn't get spoken about, like this happened for me, it like like just seeps into other things and it can like present itself in like low iron and that kind of thing, which can be really bad. Staff members, coaches, trainers as well are mostly males. I'm still not 100% comfortable just going up to them and being like, I've got my period today, but I also would 100% love to get out there and get our team talking about it, get them talking about it, get them more educated as well. It's going to be uncomfortable and it might be a bit awkward and you might feel a bit yucky about it, but I think it just starts with the conversation really, like what we're doing right now is the best thing we can be doing. You literally just taught me something in that. I was like, what? <laughs>